Uh, what I'm going to be doing is giving you a high level introduction of cloud computing, right, in general. Uh, and this is sort of to get everyone up to the same speed in terms of uh, what clouds are uh, and get you prepared for the rest of the uh, week. We'll go through uh, some definitions and characteristics of what cloud computings are, various uh, flavors of cloud computing. There's a little uh, alphabet uh, soup of uh, various terminologies. And we'll also sort of peel the covers a little bit and talk about some of the uh, underlying technology that enables cloud computing to happen. So these are sort of what uh, 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 were partly responsible for the success of cloud computing. And these are not new, they've been around for a long time, but they all sort of came together to uh, make this happen, right? Uh, so if you do have questions, sort of do feel free to ask, raise your hand, uh, get a microphone, and ask uh, questions. You don't have to wait till the end. Uh, all right, so what is cloud computing? I'm sure uh, many of you have uh, thoughts on what cloud, what cloud computing is. And you're probably all right and probably all wrong, right? Because there are, uh, it's a, sometimes it's uh, taken to be a very fuzzy term, right? Uh, but uh, thankfully, uh, we have uh, NIST to thank for and having a very concise definition. NIST is essentially the standardization body in, uh, in the US. It's sort of like the equivalent of BIS in India. Uh, and they have this very uh, nice definition that, that uh, I, I prefer. Uh, and they essentially define cloud computing as essentially a model ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable management effort. Next is what I feel are the essential components. It's essentially a model of computing, right? Uh, it's not just a computer, it's a concept. Uh, it's a way in which you do computing. And it gives you access to a shared pool of resources, right? Uh, and these are, you have certain degree of uh, flexibility. In uh, but two key, uh, and some of these definitions could very well be applicable for cloud computing as well. But two key distinctions are the ability to rapidly provision them with minimal uh, management overhead or intent, right? Which means that you get what you want quickly uh, and you don't have to jump through a lot of hoops to get access to them, right? And we'll actually try and contrast this with some of the other computing paradigms as well as we go along, right? And the, when we talk about resources over here, it's a model for getting access to a bunch of configurable computing resources. Uh, resources is a fairly broad term, right, as we will see. And this goes all the way from the computing resources such as uh, CPU, memory, uh, storage, and so on, uh, all the way to applications that can be accessed by you, right? Even end applications such as your mobile phone apps or things that you might access on the web. So all of these are a very broad category of what resources are. And these resources are made available to you by cloud service providers. So you are the consumer or, you know, Someone is a consumer, a user is a consumer, and the providers are the ones who make these resources available to you. Right? Uh, and we'll go into a few more examples of these uh, down the line. But let's uh, sort of uh, look at some of the key characteristics sort of, uh, that, that pop out from the uh, definition earlier on. Uh, so one of the distinctive uh, requirements and some, probably one of the reasons for its uh, success is the ability to get access to resources on demand, right? So what that means is that uh, all you need is some form of identity or some form of payment uh, mechanism, and you can be accessing cloud resources literally in the order of a couple of minutes, right? So you can go right now and within literally five minutes, you can be running uh, your uh, applications on let's say a virtual machine on the cloud, right? And that's the kind of on-demand access to computing that we've never had until cloud computing came along, right? So if you wanted to get access to a computing resource, right? The simplest thing is to go buy it, right? But you still have to sort of go drive over and go to a shop and buy it. Or thanks to cloud computing, you can actually do it through e-commerce, order it on uh, one of the e-commerce website. Uh, but it's still going to take, on, it's not going to be there in minutes, right? It's going to maybe take a couple of uh, uh, hours or so for you to get access to your own exclusively owned 
computing resource, right? And even if you are in a university like uh, IISC, where we have all these uh, HPC uh, supercomputers and so on, you still actually have to fill out paperwork, right? Saying that, hey, I want access to this particular uh, supercomputer, and someone will look at it, they'll verify that you're actually a student or a staff over here, and they'll approve it, and we email a username and password to start accessing it, you might be given quotas and so on, uh, in terms of how much CPU hours you can use. But all of this maybe takes the order of a day or two to get access to that, right? Uh, so in both these extremes, whether it's a sort of managed uh, enterprise or an institution like IASC, or it's your own, own computers, the latency to get access to computing is in the order of hours or days, right? But with clouds, it's literally on tap. The moment you want access to a computing resource, you get it in the order of minutes. And the order of minutes is for the first time you actually access it. Subsequently, it's actually the order of seconds to keep getting access, right? Another key uh, distinction, even for the supercomputer over here, uh, the source. Uh, typically, you go through a job queue, right? Which means it's not like you say, I want 10 machines, and you get it instantaneously, right? You actually have to join a queue because there are 100 other people on campus who want to access anywhere from one to 1,000 machines, right? So depending on how much capacity is currently available, you'll actually have to get into a queue, and it might take anywhere from a few seconds to a few hours, sometimes even days, to get access to the computing resource you want, right? On the other hand, you don't have to go through such a long gestation period on the cloud, and uh, that's one of the additional advantages as well, right? And we'll get to that in a moment when we talk about elasticity. <coughs> the second distinctive characteristic is all these resources are available over the network, right? Be it the internet or the intranet, uh, you will be accessing these resources remotely. It's not going to be sitting under your desk. It's not going to be sitting in your hand. You will have some client. It might be very well be your uh, uh, laptop or your PC or your smartphone through which you access cloud services. But the resources themselves are remote. They are managed by uh, the service provider at a remote location. This is protocols, right? The, uh, the type of, uh, uh, sort of language that you speak over the network, the computers talk to each other, is again standardized. So that's where the term services come into play. You'll keep hearing that a lot over the uh, week. Uh, because that makes it very transparent in terms of uh, interacting between your client and the uh, server, right? So 20 years back when cloud computing, or 15 years back when cloud computing was in its infancy, you could actually see dozens of different network protocols for systems to talk to each other, right? And each one was sort of siloed for a particular industry or a particular vendor. So which means that uh, you had to actually have some proprietary language that will only be uh, sort of useful for that particular client and that particular service, right? If you want to switch to a different client and different service, you'll actually to use a completely different like, uh, like uh, network language, if you want to think about it in that way, right? So in a sense, this is about uh, having some, a universal language or with server to access these services, right? And SOAP and REST and HTTP-based protocols have been uh, one of the key reasons, uh, one of the key languages, if you want to think of it in that way. Uh, and that they, they have been sort of the reason why it's been so successful, right? And a third uh, sort of uh, when you talk about uh, uh, network access is that you can actually have a variety of different clients who access it. You don't have to have, uh, you don't have to be uh, a server of a certain category to access a service that's provided by the cloud. You could very well be, if you're just uh, uh, sitting in your mobile browser, you could sort of uh, access a cloud service. Or it can even be on an embedded device and accessing a cloud service. Or you can be on the HPC machine the client requirement is very low, very minimal, and most of the lift is done in the back end by the uh, cloud services themselves, right? A third key feature is that these cloud resources are part of a shared pool of resources, right? Uh, and that essentially means that you are going to be sharing, whether it's a compute resource, storage resource, network resource, or an application or a platform, that is going to be shared by multiple users. And that's sort of one of the reasons why you get some of the uh, cost benefits of cloud, the low cost benefits, are because you're not exclusively owning a resource. Instead, the resource is being shared by many people, right? Uh, so if you think about it, let's say you have a uh, cell phone charger, right? I mean, everyone has a cell phone charger, right? In a 24-hour period, how frequently do you use it? 
how frequently you need to use it. 1, 2, 3, 4 hours, maybe tops 4 hours. The remaining 20 hours is just lying around, right? Now, if you could actually have that shared by multiple people in a smart way, in an automated way, intelligent way, right? For every six phones or every six uh, uh, persons over here, you only need a single charger, right? But on the other hand, what we currently have is each one has two or three chargers, right? Because I might forget something at home, somebody says something at work, I might lose something. So you have more than one charger per phone, while you actually, in theory, only need fewer than that, right? So that's sort of the idea behind computers as well, right? So whether it's your laptop or your PC or even some of the servers that uh, we have, they're not going to be used all the time, right? If you own a computing resource, unless you're utilizing it very frequently, right? So literally 24-7, it's actually sitting idly and it's being wasted. In fact, it's actually more than wasted. It's actually consuming power. You're actually paying to own that resource. It's not like you've paid for it and you're done with it, right? So sharing resources actually makes a lot of sense if the utilization for an individual is not very high for a particular exclusively owned resource, right? So that's why if you look at the, our HPC cluster, the reason why you have a queue is because it has 100% utilization. At any point in time, the demand is much higher than the supply, right? Which means the HPC machine is not being wasted at all, right? Every minute it's up and running is a minute where all its CPU cores are being actively used by some researcher or the other, right? But that doesn't happen often, right? Uh, for most, because HPC machines are sort of rare commodities, they're like uh, yeah, yeah, unicorns, you don't see them a lot. So there's a lot of demand for that. But on the other hand, if you have a cluster, or if you have your PC and so on, they're not going to be used 24 seven. So if you can share it with others, and you can increase the utilization of that, you get more value out of the resource that you have paid for, right? And sharing also, so when we talk about multi-tenancy, that's a term you'll uh, hear uh, over the next week or so, it essentially means that a shared resource is being used by multiple consumers, and each consumer is called a tenant, uh, and you should be okay with that, right, in terms of uh, using this same underlying hardware in, in, in conjunction with someone else, right? But at the same time, you might have issues with potentially what happens if they are able to see what I'm looking at and so on. And that's where this notion of virtualization com comes in, and you'll be hearing about that uh, a lot tomorrow and day after. And the idea over there is that you try and sandbox each tenant from each other so that they don't get to uh, snoop uh, into each other a lot, right? And uh, so you are sharing resources as individual tenants, but there is a degree of uh, separation between you uh, so that uh, you don't sort of uh, interfere with each other too much, right? And the mapping of uh, your, your, your virtual resource to the underlying physical resource is taken care of by the service provider. You don't, sometimes you don't know it, and oftentimes you don't have control over it, right? So in terms of uh, which uh, uh, physical resource you're going to be given access to, you will just be given to a virtual resource that is equivalent in uh, performance to some rated behavior, right? The last couple of points, uh, one is on elasticity. This relates to the on-demand nature, right? It's not just that you can get on-demand instantaneous access to resources. You can actually expand and contract the amount of resources that you want on demand at any point in time, right? So which means that at this, just to try out cloud computing, you might want to get access to a single VM. You might start playing around with that. And maybe develop a nice app, right? And make it available to your friends. And suddenly you have a thousand people, it gets wildly popular, you got a thousand people using that. Maybe 10,000 people starting to use that, right? And the single VM that you started off with is not good enough for you, right? So what clouds allow you to do is rapidly get more resources, more virtual machines, right, let's say, and scale out your application uh, to meet growing demand, right? At the same time, let's say you have a slump, <laughs> or you have a sort of a, a weekend coming up and people are busy off doing other things, so there maybe the demand goes down, right? So now you don't need those 10 VMs that you acquired. You can actually contract and bring it down back to maybe two or three VMs that are good enough to meet demand, right? So the ability to expand and contract the quantity of resources that you have acquired uh, is extremely useful. And it's one of the very unique characteristics of cloud computing, which you don't even find in things like cluster computing and uh, HPC systems and so on, right? And there's also this notion of infinite scaling, right? So the more demand that you have, right, the more the cloud provider can have backend machines, right? So if you're going to have, let's say, uh, 
uh, a demand for uh, 10 servers. Maybe a cloud provider has 15 servers available, right? Just to sort of, in case it starts growing. Right? 1,000 servers. You might have maybe 12,000 or so. If you've got a demand for a million servers, you'll have a lot, which means that the larger the scale of resources, the more the demand, the more it's possible for one person to come in and say that, hey, I want 10,000 servers, right? And, for, and if you want the 10,000 servers just for a couple of hours, you will get it because the backend capacity is a lot, right? So that's where some of the scaling comes in with clouds. So you almost have the notion of infinite scaling, right? So you, though you can't really go and ask for 10,000 servers and get it immediately, right? You'll actually have to, the moment you start going beyond about 100 uh, servers or so, or 100 VMs or so, typically you have to go through an additional approval process, a one-time approval process, and they might up your quota to maybe 1,000 or so, right? But the point is that you can actually get to something from zero to 1,000 without as much effort as buying 1,000 servers and keeping it locally. Now, that's why the notion of infinite comes in, seemingly infinite, right? And lastly, you have metering, and that essentially says that there are two aspects to that. One, uh, there is monitoring of how much you use, right? And you only pay for what you use, right? So if you're using one VM for half an hour, you pay for half a VM hour, right? If you're uh, using 10 VMs for two hours, you pay for 20 VM hours, right? So there is monitoring of how much of the resource you use, and you pay for what you use, and these are transparently disclosed to you at the beginning. It's almost like a menu that you get. Here's the cost, uh, here's sort of the uh, per unit cost, and sort of various uh, policies, typically very simple policies, and whatever you use, you pay for. There's also monitoring of the quality of service that the cloud provider gives to you, right? So the cloud provider says that uh, you're going to have an uptime for a VM of 99.9%, .9%, right? Which means that it's only one in maybe a thousand days, right? That you'll actually have a failure, right? Most of the other time, you will actually have uninterrupted access to that particular virtual machine, right? So there's more checks and balances both on the client side in terms of how much they pay, as well as the service provider side in terms of the guarantees that they give you. And both of these are actually audited and logged so that you can sort of, uh, if you see something is amiss, let's say they said only one failure in a thousand day, and it turns out you get two failures in a week, right? You can actually go back and tell them that, hey, here's a log of what happened. What's going on, right? So give me a discount or sort of whatever it is, right? So these are some of the five characteristics. Just to recap, on-demand access to resources, uh, literally instantaneously, access over the network at a remote uh, location uh, using standard uh, service-based uh, interfaces, access to a pool of resources by multiple tenants, uh, and ability to scale out and scale in to, from, from, uh, through a wide range of uh, resource uh, counts, and lastly, the ability to keep track of how much you've used, pay for only what you use, and get a defined quality of service for these services, right? So what we'll do right now, we, we are actually at the uh, coffee break time. So we'll take a quick break, maybe for uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, and we'll reconvene, and then we'll spend the next hour or so before lunch uh, going through the rest of the lecture, okay? Uh, so there is coffee and snacks already outside, so please queue up. Get it? If you want to use the washrooms, they are in the left-hand side uh, diagonally across. Okay? Thank you, and I'll see you back in about 10 minutes.